thank you very much for joining us tonight. Without further ado, I shall hand over to Verity. Um, I will just give a brief introduction um, for you all, so, so you all know what Verity is all about. We're very happy that she's decided to, to come and join us tonight. Um, Verity is a PhD, PhD student studying badges, and is not from Exeter, as we thought. Um, she's actually based in London, so, so we're really grateful that she's joined us tonight. Um, so she's studying badges currently, but her research interests are broad across ecology and conservation and has also worked on monitoring water vole recovery in restored habitats and box use by Dorbenton's bats to maximise maximize conservation efforts. Verity's current research on badgers contributes to a debate she is interested in from scientific welfare, political and social perspectives. But what we are all keen to learn more about tonight is our exciting work with badgers. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Verity for her presentation. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, I'm gonna just share my screen with you all so you can see my slides. Uh, just, okay. um, hopefully you should be able to see that. Give me a thumbs up or something. Yeah, great. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes um, and very happy to take questions at the end as well. So um, yeah, so yeah, I'm a PhD student. Um, I am based at Imperial, <laughs> uh, but my uh, most of my field work so far has been um, in Cornwall and Gloucestershire. So um, I've not been studying the badgers in London. <laughs> um, but I, so I'm based at Imperial and also um, ZSL, the, the London do have the Institute of Zoology, which is the kind of research and conservation side of things. Um, so I'm based at those two and part funded by um, Natural England and NERC as well. So my research focuses on basically finding the best way to count badgers and estimate badger density with camera traps. And I'm gonna explain what that has entailed so far and the first kind of findings from this research and what the sort of implications are for this and how we hope this could be useful to um, vaccination teams. So I'll just start off with a bit of um, background to the project. Uh, my clicker isn't working, bear with me. There we go. Okay, so um, so the reason that I'm studying badger density is it's something that we have a fairly limited understanding of in the UK. So um, you may know that there have been several censuses done over the years, and we've kind of estimated badger density across the kind of whole country, and we have some idea of how many badgers there might be in the UK, but that's not particularly helpful to um, maybe individuals who want to know how many badgers are on their land um, and also you know particularly in the um, context of vaccination it we want to know specifically how many animals we might have in an area we have lots of methods of estimating density already um, probably something that you're very familiar with is just doing a simple set survey and uh, you know set counts um, so i'll talk about these um, methods in a bit more detail in a moment but but basically the methods that we have are e either very um accessible but not particularly accurate or very accurate but very expensive um or quite difficult to do so i am trying to explore new methods using camera traps and i'll, I'll kind of explain why camera traps could be a really good option and i'm doing this in the context of vaccination so um, obviously, we know there's this very, very slow policy shift towards badger vaccination, um, and there are some more kind of more funding and more projects going ahead now, but we're still kind of missing this, this key part of information, which is um, information on vaccination coverage. So I'm sure anyone who here who vaccinates badgers will, will know exactly how many badgers they've vaccinated on a farm or over a season, but without knowing how many animals are there, you don't know what proportion you're reaching. And actually it's a really important aspect of disease control, you know, knowing whether you've reached 
10% of the population or 90% of the population. So we have some methods of estimating this, but none of them are particularly accurate at the moment. So in terms of how we kind of count badges now, so obviously, yes, we're probably all familiar with doing set surveys. So the um, idea of this is that you would do a survey, find out how many sets there are in an area and take a kind of average number of badges that are gonna be in each main set that is. Um, and then you can kind of estimate how many are in the area. Now there's several assumptions with this. Um, one is that there are, um, well, what, one is that somebody can distinguish between a main set and an outlier set, which I know lots of people can do, but it is difficult. Um, also, there's this assumption that there's this kind of standard number of badges that inhabit each set, which obviously is not true, and, and it, can, it can vary massively between the environment and the resources. Um, and there's a study actually at Woodchester Park, which demonstrated this really well, where they, they had a, um, I think it was a 16 year study of the badges there, and they were looking at 21 badger groups, and over that time, the the density of badgers tripled, but the number of social groups stayed the same. So if they were just simply counting the number of social groups, they would have, would have had no idea that the density has actually increased so much. So they are definitely helpful, um, potentially not as accurate as we would need them to be for estimating things like vaccination coverage. Now, DNA analysis is a very good alternative. This is actually one of the most accurate methods that we have. So um, you can do things like look at the individuals based on their hair or feces, so you can look at latrines. So this particular example here, what they've done is they've put out um, bits of barbed wire near the set, and then as the badgers go past, it obviously snags a bit of their hair, and somebody can go back every day, take those hair samples, and then do the DNA analysis. And from that, you can literally see what individuals are in, um, in the area. And you can do something called capture recapture analysis. So that basically looks at um, how many individuals you've got and how often you see those same individuals again, and how often you see new individuals that maybe you didn't have the day before. Um, so yeah, you can do that with hair samples, you can do that with feces. Now, this is, it, it is one of the most accurate methods that we have and capture recapture is used all over the world. It's a tried and tested method, it works really well. But this is incredibly resource heavy. Obviously, you need people that can go back there every day. It's not just a one-off survey. And that, DNA, that process of DNA extraction um, and identification of individuals is actually very expensive. So this is not gonna be something that's kind of readily available to everyone. Um, so accurate, but, but very expensive, unfortunately. Um, and, then, and then finally, we can get some information from roadkill. So the theory behind this being that where the density of badgers is higher, there should therefore be more kind of collisions um, on the road. Now this, it can give us some information, but it obviously doesn't hold true in areas where there maybe aren't so many roads. And so that's simply why you don't get so many collisions, not because of badger density, or perhaps the roads are smaller, so cars aren't going so fast, you know, that kind of thing. And it also doesn't give us a number. It will give us a, a relative measure of density that some areas are more populated than others, but it doesn't kind of give us a number of how many animals are in that area. So this is why I'm, I'm exploring what information we can get from camera traps instead. So if anyone who's not familiar with a camera trap, these are remote cameras that we can put out um, typically on trees, on fence posts, this kind of thing. And they're triggered by motion and heat. So when an animal goes past, here's an example of me testing it out in Regent's Park. When an animal goes past, it should um, detect that motion and the heat. The heat's important so that you don't just get um, loads of pictures of grass waving around. <laughs> um, and then it should take a, a photo or it can take a video as well. And the great thing about camera traps is that it allows us to monitor animals with very little disturbance. So we get this kind of natural behavior. And the reason that they could be good for this is, so it's, it's great to get that behavior that's not disturbed, but also we, and we kind of get their natural um, patterns of, of behavior. So we're not kind of interrupting with what they would normally do. 
it's potentially a lot cheaper than DNA analysis. Now, obviously, buying a whole load of these cameras is going to be expensive, and I'm not suggesting that everyone should go out and, and buy some. Really, for the kind of analysis that I'm doing, we need sort of 50 cameras minimum per site. So it's, it is a lot of investment at the beginning. But the idea would be, hopefully, you know, if there's a, a long term vaccination study, perhaps, you know, one of the government trials or something like that, they could invest in this at the beginning. And over the time, obviously, those costs um, would be spread out over that time. So it's potentially something that is accessible to vaccination projects, maybe not every small vaccination group, which I know is, is you know, often run with volunteers and not always well funded. So. Um, not potentially available to everyone but um you know you can even get some information just from a few cameras so but there are some uh challenges that i have to overcome before i can estimate badger density with the cameras so the first thing that's really important is that the number of um badges that you capture on camera doesn't necessarily mean kind of equal badger density so if you imagine you put a camera out and you get hundreds of images of badges and then you put another one out somewhere else and you only get 10 images it doesn't necessarily mean that the first place is more populated because you could have just put that camera right by the entrance to a set or it happens to be on a badger run or something like that so i have to find a way for uh, of controlling for this and the other thing is that the badges all look the same on the cameras so camera traps are um very very good for species like tigers and leopards which have um, unique markings on them. So just like doing kind of DNA analysis, you can tell those individuals and you would know whether that's five tigers in the area or 50 different animals. And we can't do this with badgers. I'm, I'm sure those of you who have really got to know kind of like local badger sets, you know, you get to know individuals and by eye, you might be able to tell them apart. But when it's on the cameras and you're looking at thousands of pictures of them, we just don't have that enough detail to be able to tell the individuals apart all the time, unless they've lost an eye or something like that, that's quite obvious. Um, so with those two challenges then, how do we estimate density? So I'm testing three different methods alongside each other. I'm gonna briefly explain how each of them works just so you kind of understand the differences. So the first, the first method that I'm looking at is called the random encounter model. Now this is a relatively new method. Um, it has been tested with lots of other species and it appears to work well, but there could be something unusual about badger behavior, perhaps, which um, doesn't quite fit with the method. So we need to test it on badgers and check that it works. So the random encounter model is based on the ideal gas model, which is a, a physics theory. So briefly, what this, um, what this kind of theory explains is that if you had a box of particles like this and they're all whizzing around, you should be able to estimate how many particles are in that box based on their speed of movement and how many times they collide. And if you know the size of the box, then you can estimate the density. Now we apply this to animal populations. And what you do is you put out a load of cameras and over the area that you're looking at, if you can get the animal's kind of general speed of movement, which I can estimate from the cameras, um, and you then look at how many times those individuals collide and it's not with each other the collisions now between a badger and a camera trap so essentially you're looking at how many times those animals are caught on camera but like I said it's not just um the number of counts is not just the important thing here the important thing about this model is that we actually model the underlying detection rate as well now, the key thing about this is that the animals don't need to be individually recognizable. So we don't need to be able to tell one individual apart from the other. It's purely based on those encounter rates and um, the kind of underlying detection rate is modeled. But the cameras have to be placed randomly. And that's really important. So when I'm putting the cameras out, I can't say, oh, there's a lovely big set over there. I'll put my camera next to it. I have to work with a random grid and I have to put my cameras strictly on that grid um and that that will mean some of them are next to the entrance of a set and some of them are nowhere near where badgers will ever go but that's fine it should kind of all even out is the theory okay the second method that i'm using is something called distance sampling so you might be familiar with this um from other kind of doing doing mammal surveys it's it's a it's a method that's traditionally used 
for mammals and birds and how you might know it is walking down a transect and counting how many of, of the desired species you see and what you do is you'd record them in distant bands away from the transects so you might say um, I can see a robin and that's 50 meters away from me. I can see a blackbird and that's 200 meters away from me. So that's how we would typically do distance sampling. Um, I'm doing point sampling, which is a similar thing, but basically what you do is the observer would stand in a point and look, have a 360 view and look at the how many species or how many of the individual of the species they're looking at, they can count. And again, it would be in those distance bands. So you might say, I can see a fox within 50 meters. I can see another fox within a kilometer. Or, you probably couldn't see that far, but <laughs> in the distance bands. Um, the cameras do a similar thing, except they don't have that 360 view. They just have a wedge view. So I can put the cameras out and they're doing the survey for me. And I can actually estimate the distances of the badgers from the camera as well. So I can work out those distance bands. So that's distance sampling. Again, this is a tried, tried and tested method and it, it's really commonly used. Um, although camera trapping with distance sampling is, is a relatively new um, science. And similar to the random encounter model, animals don't need to be individually recognizable, but the cameras do have to be placed randomly. And then the final method that I'm using is something called spatially explicit mark recite. So, um, this is very similar to mark recapture or capture recapture that I talked about earlier. Um, but rather than re kind of catching the animals or in, in the case of the DNA, it was looking at how many of those hair samples you get one day and then how many are there the next day and which individuals are you seeing? I'm actually seeing which individuals I'm seeing on the camera traps. So for this, it's really important that the animals are individually recognizable. Now, this is not a method that I would recommend other groups to do. This is just, um, if you remember me saying, capture recapture is one of the best methods that we have available. It's one of the most accurate methods that we have. So if I can use a kind of gold standard method to estimate the density, and then I can compare the random encounter model and distance sampling to that, then I'll know whether the random encounter model and distance sampling have worked. And I don't have to go through the process of making sure animals are individually recognizable. So for this, I do have to do that, but it's I'm trying to move away from this method, basically. So what we have for this method is that I have a number of marking occasions. So for me, this was um, the vaccination nights and we would mark the badges and I will, I'll show you some photos of how we did that later on. Um, and then I have reciting occasions. So this is basically the nights that the cameras are out. So they're typically out for sort of four to six weeks. And each night is a kind of reciting occasion. And I'd look at how many individuals are recited on those nights. So you get some animals that are seen, you know, every night, you get some that you never see again. And then of course you have some of the population which you didn't vaccinate and you didn't mark and they are never seen again. Uh, sorry, they, they, they're not marked, but they are on the cameras. So, um, so from this, I can estimate density, but of course it's very important that the animals are individually recognizable. But this is the kind of gold standard method that I'm comparing the others to. Okay, so the field work for this, um, I worked in four sites in Cornwall to do this and had a lot of cameras. So I had lots of fun uh, in the summer, just putting out hundreds and hundreds of cameras across these farms. Um, and then we also vaccinated and fur clipped the badgers um, in these farms. So we had 63 badgers across these four sites. And so I had this opportunity to do this work because I was working with the Cornwall um, vaccination group. And so the, the, the Cornwall group have um, assigned a few sites that are scientific research sites as well. So rather than just doing vaccination, um, the animals are anaesthetized and we also take blood samples, we look at tooth wear, you know, we take so all sorts of metrics from, from the animals. So this gave me an opportunity to, to make the animals individually recognizable for the camera traps. <laughs> and so um, obviously in vaccination, you would always give the badger a fur clip, but for the purpose of my research, we made these fur clips a little bit bigger so that they were visible on camera and each one was unique. 
And obviously we could only do this because the badgers are asleep. You wouldn't normally be able to do this. So um, we used Morse code for this. So a series of dots and dashes. So we'd be able to tell each one apart. Um, so as you can see, we used the very short code. So just like a single dot for the cubs. And then we used the longer ones for the adults. We had to resort to some codes that weren't Morse code because we ran out of things and you can't get dash, dash, dot, dash <laughs> on the side of a badger. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so, um, and then you can see from these pictures how they show up on the um, camera trap images themselves. So obviously I've selected the best pictures. <laughs> they're not all like this. And most of the time they're quite difficult to, to see that fur clip, but some of them I was able to identify the individuals. So I'm gonna share the first results that I have from this. Um, I'll explain what these graphs mean. So basically what I have here is I have one method of estimating badger density on the x-axis and, and another method of estimating density on the y-axis. And if both methods came to the same answer, they would all fit perfectly along this dotted line. They obviously don't. <laughs> so not all the, uh, all the methods agreed with each other on what the density was. Some of the new co compare quite well. You can see here, obviously, um, the distance sampling um, Mark III site kind of agree at this site. And here you can see actually lots of them are quite close to the line. And what I'm taking from this is that the, the methods that come to the most similar answer most often is the random encounter model and distance sampling. And I'm not surprised about that because they're, they're, the methods are relatively similar to each other. So I'm not surprised, they should kind of come to the same result. Now the tricky one here was the Mark Resight. So if you remember, this was the kind of gold standard method that I was gonna use to compare all my other density estimates too. In reality, I just didn't have enough animals to kind of recite. So it really needs a minimum of, of kind of 15 or 20 animals to be marked. Um, and then at least 20 occasions where you see those animals again. And actually on some of the sites where we were working, the badger density was so low that on one particular site, we only actually marked three animals. And I only saw one of them again uh, three times, I think. So obviously I couldn't do a lot with that data. So which was a shame because I had this, this kind of gold standard that I was gonna compare everything else to. So the conclusion from this first bit of the research is that we have these density estimates from the random encounter model and distance sampling, which are relatively similar to each other, but I don't know if they are similar to the truth. So I need another method of finding that out. And I will come to that um, a little bit later, explain how I'm gonna tackle that one. There's another challenge that I wanted to talk to you all about, which is um, how then from this, I determine vaccination coverage. So let's pretend I've got a density estimate, which I'm absolutely sure is correct. How would I work out vaccination coverage? So if we imagine this is the site that we're working on, first of all, I need to work out what the population size is. So this is not how many animals per square kilometer, this is how many actually on the site that you're working at. So if I estimate that there's 20 badgers per square kilometer, and I'm working on an area that's two square kilometers, it's it fairly easy to work out the population size. It would just be the, the density times the area. So that's fine. I, would, I have found out that there's 40 animals in that area. You then look at how many you vaccinated. So let's say you vaccinated 20 animals, then your vaccine coverage, you'd, you vaccinated 20 out of 40 individuals, that would be a vaccination coverage of 50%. It should be that easy, and I wish it was. <laughs> but the problem we've got here is um, working out what area you've, you've vaccinated, essentially. So if we take this farm example again, and I'll put in some field boundaries, pretend these are the kind of fields that we're working in, and you've done your survey and you found two badger sets. So these are the, the red dots of the badger sets. So you put your traps out and you have vaccinated the animals there. And then I come along and I put out my cameras and I have estimated the density and I can say, okay, I think there's um, 10 badgers per square kilometer on this land. So you could then say, well, we're working on these two farms. So I'll just work out the area of that. And then that's our kind of vaccinated area. But in reality, 
if I put this here, so this is representing the kind of home range of the badgers, um, their territory size. So actually, if you've put some traps by this set, you have vaccinated some of the animals, you have vaccinated this set basically, and you've vaccinated the kind of area that they will cover. So actually you've kind of vaccinated that circle rather than that entire field. And you've also done the same thing with this set. So you've vaccinated this set and this is where the animals travel. Now, if there was a set um, could still be on this land that you were trying to vaccinate, could be here, but the badgers don't go as far as your traps. So actually you haven't reached that set. So the, the area that you've vaccinated is more like the badger's home range. So this is the thing that's difficult to work out. <laughs> and there are, there are some ways of doing this. And actually we've, we've come to this conclusion fairly recently. And it's quite exciting because this method is, is really, really accessible to kind of all vaccination groups of working out what the, the um, badger territories are. So I just wanted to kind of show you this. So this is some research that was done quite a long time ago by my supervisor, um, yeah 20 years ago and basically what she found was that uh, sorry that's 30 years ago what she found was that um if you take this uh picture b in the middle here so what this is showing is each one of these big circles is a, a main badger set and you can do something called i have to get the pronunciation of this right i think you say it Derichlet, Derichlet tessellations, there's all sorts of names for this. Um, Thysian polygons is another one, or Vinoy diagrams, they're all the same thing. Um, but what you can do is you can kind of estimate the home ranges using the center point of the badger's main set. So these are generated here, so you can see these kind of polygons that are made around each of the dots. So remember, each of the dots is the, is the main badger set. And it makes these polygons and then what she's done is she's overlaid the over the top of it um these smaller dots are the latrines and and obviously we know that often latrines mark the edge of territory and actually those latrines line up really well with the tessellations themselves so it kind of just proves that um those tessellations have done quite well at estimating those animal home ranges so if we take this back to the example of where you're vaccinating if you'd found all of these sets, what you would end up is something like this. <laughs> um, and actually the area then that you have vaccinated, I, I've, I've added in an extra set here. We'll imagine we have some um, traps here too. <laughs> the area that you vaccinated actually becomes um, this whole area here. And I've been doing this with um, some of the sites that we did this research at. So this is one of them. So here the, the red dots are the, um, the main sets and you can see the tessellations that are made around the outside of these. So those are representing the territories of those sets. And the really lucky thing about where we worked here is that the badgers here were actually GPS collared for a few years. And we know exactly where the animals in this region have been moving. So um, when we overlay the GPS data on top of that, so each one of these colors represents all of the GPS locations of one animal. So the light blue would be one animal, dark blue would be another animal. Um, I think they record their location every 20 minutes. You can see that they fit fairly well with these um, tessellations. So there'll be, there's clearly one group here, there's clearly another group here, and there's one here too. Now this one was a bit confusing because there's another, set over here and we found that the badgers were going in between them all the time it was a bit more complicated but then there's obviously um another social group over here and there's clearly uh, this this kind of line between them so this is quite exciting because all you would need to know to be, to be able to produce something like this is to do a survey and to know where the sets are you don't need any other information you don't need the gps data you uh, latrine data would help because then you could you could lay that over the top of this and say, oh yeah, actually the latrines match up fairly well with the polygons, so that'd be good. But you don't need that information. 
Um, you just need the locations of, of the main sets. Now, it does help, I have to say, if you know where the sets are on the neighboring land. So for example, I want to know where the set is over here because I want to be able to draw the line that kind of divides that territory, the, 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 the end of that territory. And probably from the GPS data, I can see that it's along here, but obviously not everyone's got GPS data. So um, this certainly would work if you were vaccinating a larger area of contiguous land and you had access to all of it and you know everyone's neighbors were happy for you to do a survey there. That's great. If you if the areas where you're working are very patchy, this would be a bit more difficult, but um, it's definitely possible. So that's the kind of next step for this is to try and use this to then estimate the area that you vaccinated and then use the density estimates to then calculate the population size and vaccination coverage. So we're not quite there with estimating vaccination coverage, but we're getting close. <laughs> so then finally, what's next for the project? Well, obviously when I showed you the results, uh, had this, uh, the slight problem that we don't have this gold standard method to compare the other ones to. So as it stands, I've got two methods that compare fairly well to each other, but I don't know what the truth is. So, It'd be really great if we could try this somewhere where we kind of know what the population or the density is and we can compare it to. So when the random encounter model was first invented, they tested it um, at Whipsnade Zoo. So they knew exactly how many animals they that lived there and they could use this method to count them and then they could compare them and see how well it did. And it did really well. So if I could do some this somewhere where we kind of knew what the badger population was, I could compare it and then I would know that my estimates in Cornwall were accurate or not. So we have chosen someone for this. So we've been doing um, all of this research again at Woodchester Park because um, Woodchester, as I'm sure some of you all know Woodchester, they've been studying the badgers there for years and years and years. They know all about them. They, they know they have a very good understanding of what badge density is in the area. So that gives me a fairly good baseline to compare this to. So I've done all of this research again, plus two extra methods of estimating density, just to get as many methods as possible to compare, to find out which is the best way of estimating badge density with the camera traps. So um, Wichester is great as well, because they, they have also collared, GPS collared their badges so I can get GPS data and I can do those tessellations again and line everything up. So it's a, it's a really good study site to do this. So we've got some of the camera, camera trap images back already and the, the team are going through these now. So um, I think we're probably just a few months away from getting the results from that stuff. So that's really exciting. Um, but in the long term, really what we'd like to be able to do is, is do this at sites where badger density is low, because obviously, the policy change is to kind of move away from badger culling. So sites which have been culled would now be vaccinated. And we have no idea what the kind of implications of that might be. And what we would hope to do is be able to estimate badger density at the start of that vaccination period and then monitor it over, say, the next four years. So we can see how the population changes and potentially what the impacts would be on vaccination efforts. So one of the theories is that, you know, at the end of a culling period, you might be left with a population of badgers which are trap shy because they're the animals which haven't ever gone into the traps. And actually that's gonna then be really difficult to vaccinate there because you've got a whole range of animals that won't go in the traps. Um, but over time, that should change as the population becomes less trap shy, you know, more animals are born and they're happy to go into the traps. So actually we should see vaccination coverage relatively kind of increase over time. So um, that that's the kind of next aim for our research. So we're kind of working on that this year. Um, so yeah, that's that's everything. Just special thanks to the everyone who's funded this and, and helped with the project. Um, but also I just wanted to include a few photos here just to show you but obviously it's not just badgers that show up on the camera, I get all sorts of wildlife. Um, and you never know what's gonna turn up. And, and this um, picture here was um, a pine martin that we found in Cornwall, in West Cornwall. And there are 
there is there's not a population, a recorded population of pine martins in, well, in Cornwall, let alone uh, West Cornwall. It's the furthest west from these animals have been recorded. So um, we're obviously focusing on badgers, but it's nice to be able to look at other wildlife as well and see what turns up. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening. I hope that was interesting and um, happy to take questions. Thank you, Verity. That was so interesting. Um, and we use them, I think most badger groups do use them regularly. We use them a lot. And um, you're right, it is lovely to have, to be able to capture behavior that you wouldn't see because obviously, you know, when you're watching them, they're aware of you being there. And to just be able to see their natural behavior is a real treat. So, um, so we use them an awful lot. Um, I think we've got some questions. Yeah, in... we have. Um... I think these actually all tie up together, so I'll ask them as um, one question. Um, firstly, how do you work out the tessellations? And then going on from that, what home ranges were you using? And are the tessellations ca calculated on main sets alone or would you include secondary sets? And do habitats play a part in the calculations? Okay, so yeah, lots of good questions there. So um, the tessellations are really interesting because, I mean, really, you don't have to do these calculations yourself. It literally couldn't be simpler. It's all done for you in um, GIS. So QGIS, free mapping software, which maybe some of you use already, you know, to, to map the sites where you're vaccinating. Um, if you put in the GPS locations of the main sets, and it is just main sets we're using here. I mean, obviously, <laughs> like you said, badgers don't always follow the rule book and they can often do some really complicated things. And we certainly found this with the collaring was that some of the animals just went all over the place all the time. And it was really difficult to work out what kind of territory they belonged to. But um, so, yeah, obviously there'll be some exceptions to the rules, but generally, you know, a set, uh, a main, and the animals which op occupy a main set should then have their sort of defined territory. So um, these, the polygons are, yeah, they're estimated for you. You don't have to put in any kind of metrics, um, but it's based on the main set. So it is important that you've got information about one main set and the neighboring main set if you if you then you know that area of land next to next door to it wasn't surveyed and you don't have the information there it will just assume that the set that's here also occupies that land so really it does need to be over a contiguous area um i don't know if that's answered all the questions i can't remember quite what they were oh one was about habitat you don't you yeah. don't put habitat um details into this although obviously qj QGIS does have the um, possibility for you to put habitat data in, but habitat data isn't factored into how the polygons are made. The polygons are made, um, it's more of a kind of mathematical thing that works out that um, if you've got kind of a, a main set here, that the animals that occupy this habitat are going to be closer to this main set than they are to the one kind of over here. And so it works, it kind of works out what they should be from all of the main set data that you put in. And this has not just been done for badgers, this is a, a well-established method that's been used for many other species. And I've, I've seen somebody do it with um, magpies actually, where they've had um, nests of magpies and they know the locations of those and they put all of those in and it builds the polygons. And then over the top of that, they can put data where they've seen those magpies caching nuts and they specifically know that it's, you know, which individual is which because they'll be color ringed. So they know who's doing what. And the magpies stick within, I think it was in within 10 meters to those territory boundaries, caching their nuts inside the territory that this has been kind of calculated as their supposed territory. Actually, it works really well. Now it's not, it's not completely, um, you know, perfect as you probably saw from the GPS color data that I put there. You know, some of the animals are sort of spilling over into the other ones. There was a line here and some of the GPS points spilled over. So it's not absolutely perfect, but I would say at the moment, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good estimation of um, territory sizes. Oh, that, that, that's brilliant. 
Um, particularly as we are thinking of going more down the QGIS route, this could yeah. be very, very, very useful. Um, somebody else has got a question. Um, does counting badges directly at each set give comparable numbers? Yeah, so I guess um, it depends. What, it depends how you do it. I, I, I completely can see that this method is incredibly complicated. And actually probably some people think rather than put out a hundred cameras, why don't I just maybe put one camera by a set and see if I can see how many individuals are coming out of the set. Or maybe I'll just do a survey and wait by the set and see if I can count the number of individuals. And that can definitely give you information and it can definitely give you helpful information. I think the work that I'm doing is more focused on if we were going to vaccinate hundreds of square, you know, if, if vaccination policy was really kind of rolled out and we're trying to estimate badger density across much larger areas, how would we do it? Um, and potentially, you know, government funded operations might have access to lots of cameras and things like that. So um, yes, just doing badger surveys at, at a single set can give you some useful information, definitely. And, and I have spoken to badger groups where, you know, they say, well, actually, I have been able to identify some individuals because, you know, we know that in one set there was a ginger badger and then there was another badger that lost its eye and you know actually they do have ways of telling individuals apart and and they could put a camera out or they or maybe the person who the landowner you know it's just really loves their badgers and has got to know them and kind of knows how many are around and that information is definitely useful um and if you've got that information you know why not use it if if the landowner or or you watch the badgers there and think you know how many might be living there it's definitely useful information Brilliant. Um, and I think this is going back to the uh, QGIS um, question. Can this predict the locations of sets if you have some data, set data to go on? Hmm. I've not used it for that purpose. Um, I would be surprised if it could predict accurately. And the reason I say that is because it really is dependent on having the kind of neighbouring sets to, to be able to make those territories um, uh, kind of reliably. So uh, where, for example, I've got one site where kind of mostly around the site we've also surveyed, but then there's one side where we just, we haven't had land access, so we haven't done any surveys on that side. And it's obviously showing then the sites, the sets that are here have got a huge territory on that side because it just doesn't know, it doesn't know that there aren't, we haven't surveyed there it's not that there aren't any sets there so i'd be surprised if it could predict um where sets are like are likely to be but i know that there are people um at the zoo that work on those kind of predictions um not for badges but i'm sure there's kind of software that they could use <laughs> would do that but i'm not sure this would yeah sure um and for anybody sort of looking to get a camera trap um could you recommend a reliable type of camera trap yeah, definitely. So the ones that I use um, are browning camera traps. Um, I think they're in the range of about £160. So they're not that cheap, but they are brilliant. I've never had any issues with my browning cameras. Um, the, I, I highly recommend we, I went through a company called Nature Spy, who kind of supply all of the um you know wildlife groups and <laughs> um organizations and things like that and they work a lot with London Zoo and um and I believe they work with Springwatch as well and they gave me such brilliant advice about what model to get and you know I explained the kind of work that I was doing and they suggested what um what kind of camera I might want so um I would highly recommend kind of getting some advice from someone but my browning camera traps are brilliant and really easy to use as well Excellent. Um, well, that that's all for the questions we've got on chat. So unless Jenny's got anything else that she wants to add. Well, I was just typing in really quickly because <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that they picked up thermal imaging on some of these cameras, because as you as you quite rightly said, you often get, you know, a twig dangling in the way. And, and that's all you get is, is you know, 400 shots of a, of a bit of grass blowing. But um, but I wasn't aware that they picked up 
um, heat. Yeah. So I guess it's the a slight difference in that it isn't it isn't thermal imaging like you might see on. You know, they had that on Winter Watch recently, didn't they? Where they kind of scan across the field and you can see <laughs> all the all the hairs in the field. It's not quite kind of thermal imaging like that, but it does. Um, the sensor does react to heat and that is definitely not foolproof I have got thousands and thousands of images of grass <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, it it definitely does cut down on the number that you get um, and yeah I think that's a really neat addition because <laughs> particularly in areas where if there's no if there's not too much movement um, in the woods or something like that then it re it's really good at just picking up animals that are moving rather than kind of leaves flying around or things. Mm. Where I've worked on farms where they've had, um, where it's arable farming and they've literally had like wheat that's going back and forward like this, I just get the wheat. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, and I agree, Browning's are really good cameras. Is but, that what you have? But sometimes if if we put them up in, in a, a fairly open position and we don't use the our, our expensive ones <laughs> just in case they go for a walk um but yes that's that's right if there's no more questions for verity i'll just thank you very much for for sharing that with us that was really interesting mm -hmm. and something obviously that's you know it is a problem sometimes because you know people often say how many badgers are, are likely to be you know how many badgers make up a social group and um it's very difficult to say and I, I think the other difficulty is, as you said at the beginning, is identifying whether a set is a main set, because you can have a main set of just one or two entrances, you know, and it, it can be really difficult and it's quite subjective as well. Yeah. So, um, um, so this is the this is the only problem with the polygons is that it really does need that. And we're going back through our survey records now thinking, oh, remember that set? Was that a main set? I don't know. It wasn't that big. And then we look at our trapping records to see how many animals we caught there and were there cubs and things so mm -hmm. yeah you you definitely do need the skills to be able to tell between the two but it's not always easy <laughs> yes thank you Verity that was really interesting <laughs>